You want to do it, Sam? Oh, man. You caught us on a circus night. A circus night? Yeah, it's just kind of crazy around here. Yeah. Yeah. How are you, man? Doing good. Good. How about you? I'm good. Yeah? It's good to meet you. I've been... uh, been watching your stuff on the gram and other places and uh it looks like you play all the instruments as many as i can reasonably (laughs) dedicate any time to i think (laughs) which one's the main the go-to um i've probably been playing key well i've definitely been playing keys the longest so keys is probably the first instrument i picked the rest of them up when i was about 12 or so okay so seems like you're comfortable behind the keys yeah you remind me of my buddy Wes Bailey. Uh, I don't know why. I think it's the way you play him. Do you know him? I don't. He plays uh, for Moon Taxi. He's a keyboard player for Moon Taxi. He's a he's, great band name. Yeah. Moon Taxi. Yeah, they're out of Nashville. You should check them out. Uh, I, I also saw that you had some videos where you were doing like, you were playing all the instruments, but you were cutting back and forth like you were, you know, every member of the band. Were you on a drum machine? Is that what you had? Um, I mean, 808? I- I've done stuff like that, you yeah. know. I've sometimes I'll actually play the drum kit, but you know it's hard to have music without a groove. Yeah, you gotta have that. Lay it down. Let the uh, the rhythm section is really the heartbeat. Yeah. Can't. No, if the if the rhythm section's doing it right, everybody else can lay back and not even play anything and still music, you know. That's true. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. That's kind of all you need to really be music. Is is yeah. is is a rhythm section. That's a the bit. core, you know. Yeah. I guess the base of like jazz and you know bluegrass and all that is always just that heartbeat back there thumping away and then everybody else can take their breaks. Yeah. It's pretty cool. What are your uh like your main genres that you that you play? You know, I personally will play just about anything like for my own enjoyment. Yeah. Um but what got you into it? Like what 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 did you listen to and you're like, "Okay, that's that's what makes me want to make music. I want to make this." I think the first thing that ever made me want to make music was Audio Slave or like oh, some yeah. kind of grunge band. Really? It, it was them or another grunge band. Yeah. Yeah. And just, y- were you already playing keys at the time when you heard that? Yeah. Um, just playing like the things that, you know, how I, I don't know if you've ever used like a child's keyboard, but yeah. they have the teach you how to play a song where it just shows which keys to yeah. press type thing. Yeah. Like that's how I learned my first songs. Really? How old were you? Mm, early, I was five, six, maybe. Really? Yeah. Did you take piano lessons when you were a kid? Nev- well, I think I took one or two lessons, and I didn't like it. And so... So how did you learn how to play? Well, the reason that I wanted to play at all like, was from having encouragement like from my parents. Um, I they, I had that like child's keyboard, like I told you. Yeah. And I was just playing jingles off the TV one day. Like and, listening by ear and then playing them back? Yeah. And my wow. parents were like, well, this is not exactly normal. Yeah. So they were like, hey, do you like doing that? You know? And being a kid, you're just like, yeah, you know, whatever. Like, I didn't realize it was impressive. And they were like, well, if you keep doing that, like, you could probably get really good at it. Like, do you want to do that? And I was like, sure, you know? So they just kind of, like, led me into it in a very kind of encouraging way. Yeah. Just kind of supported you along the way. Yeah. That's cool. And you were just parroting stuff that you that you heard. Just, yeah. Just, I mean, still, you know. Really? That's I'll hear it in my mind and then try to play that, usually. Yeah. I mean, it. it's obvious that you're a good ear player because I, we were listening to some music while you were setting up over here, and you just started digging into what was playing. Yeah. Is that how you? Uh, is that how you got chops as a kid after you started figuring out how to how to how the machine worked, how the how the keyboard worked? started listening to other stuff yeah you you get into other genres and you emulate you know for a long time like it's kind of part of the musical progression yeah you emulate what you hear and learn that way that's the funnest way to learn i think is to make music and then did you have to get serious about it at some point and learn the theory behind it and i kind of did yeah i mean i know enough of that kind of stuff to write some stuff that could pass as jazzy and like play you know standards and stuff like that but i probably don't have as as like extensive of a knowledge of it as somebody who actually went to school for it or anything like that did you ever go to school for it or get real serious about learning the Mm, nuts and bolts i mean 
in the what I know of it is to like communicate it to other musicians. So if I write something that's jazzy, it they will ask for a chart or something, you know, yeah. and I have to understand it at least to that level. Gotcha. Um, but no, it's a funny story. My parents kind of were discouraged from sending me to jazz school in Just a, in a funny the, way. They didn't want you to be a musician when you grew up. <laughs> not, grew up. Not that it was that. Like I said, they were extremely supportive. So yeah. when I was younger, my younger teens, they had me like in studios with my bands and, or if I had written something, they would like literally hire older musicians to like play for sessions and like get recordings done cool. and stuff like that. Of your stuff that yeah. you had written. Yeah. Um, and some of those guys were the ones that had discouraged them. They my mom always likes to tell the story <laughs> it's like somebody pulled her aside and was like hey don't let him go to jazz college like it's gonna ruin the way he plays or some shit like really that, that really like resonated with her so she was like always discouraged me from it oh they they didn't want you to be tainted by <laughs> academia they were like this kid's got it like just let him feel it and That's, do it you know i try not to like feed into that too much because it feels like i'm boosting my own ego but yeah. i do appreciate that story i uh did i see you at union jacks the other night playing oh yeah yeah uh, it was about a month ago probably. I, i'm the house drummer there for the open jams on saturdays most weeks okay so yeah i'm usually there and i'll do a set of my own stuff if there's time you, I, I don't know that you were on the drums when i was watching you play you might have mm. been on the keys okay yeah yeah there's been a couple nights where i've come back from another gig or something and i have the keys in the car i'll play them there cool so so you're just you're that you're the house drummer is there another is there a uh a complete house band or is it just you and you're hosting, you're just providing the backbeat and bringing uh, everybody else up? Yeah, no, it's not just me. There's usually another like lead player. Sometimes there's a violin player, there's a guitar nice. player. And then the lead guy, Chris Marshall, is the guy who like, you know, hosts the jam and puts gotcha. it on and everything. Okay. And he will like open with a few tunes and then it's just an open like free for all for a few hours. So I was there listening a little bit and then going to hang out with my buddies and play pool and coming back and listening a little bit. And at no point did it sound like an open mic night where somebody was just bombing up there. That's to good. me. It sounded great the whole time. Yeah. It seems like you guys have put together a good crew of uh, attendees and musicians that come out and have chops. Definitely. And, and if it's a Saturday and you're a musician and, and you don't have a gig, you're definitely looking to jam because that's just, it yeah. becomes like habitual. Yeah, so you probably get some some really good some really good folks in there that aren't that just happen to not be working that night. Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so, what time does that start at UJ's every Saturday? It's like seven thirty to eleven ish. Okay. Yeah, it was fun, man. I love what's happened to that place. Have you been around? So, so like, have you? How long have you been in Knoxville? Did I've you grew up here. Been here for just over a year, <laughs> but I feel like everybody tells me about the old Union Jacks, and they have nothing but terrible things to say. Really? <laughs> well, I hate everybody that said, has a terrible thing to say about the OG UJs <laughs> yeah. because that place was a national treasure, man. What makes you say that? It was the diviest, smokiest mm. Cheers bar in town, and it was. You know, nothing nice about it at all. Um, You're not making a great case for it so far. I love dive bars. <laughs> and it was, I mean, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't done up. It was barely, it was barely hanging on. Yeah. But at, you knew everybody there. And it all, it also kept, uh, it, it kept people coming in on other nights that, you know, weren't regulars. But at any moment, you knew half of the bar in there. And it was a lot of people too. So it was, uh, it was just kind of a little hole in the wall, divey place that you know didn't serve wine and liquor, so you couldn't really bring your whole party there after right. you'd been out and about. You know, I got you a different crowd. It was a different crowd, beer crowd. Yeah. yeah. Did they still have live music? Not really. No. Sometimes, but not really at all. There was trivia every Sunday night. The Union Jacks pub quiz. A guy named Marshall did, and uh, that was kind of the most. That was the only time you really heard anybody addressing the whole bar at one time, music or otherwise, <laughs> was during the pub quiz. Yeah, that's it. They started doing trivia a little uh, after he left, too, but, like, no, there really wasn't much music there. It was divey, dude, but also great and perfect. And the place that you would find in London when you, like, ducked into a bar just to get out of the rain, you know, just a warm little cozy 
joint. But now Aaron's made it really nice, and yeah. I hate to say it, but I might like it better now. Yeah. I mean, it's it's awesome. It's awesome now that it's got all the bells and whistles, and it feels like a place you could would not be uh, ashamed to take your grandmother to. <laughs> yeah. No, I dig it. It's a fun place to be. Yeah. Are there any other open mics in town that you that play like you, Chris, New Jacks? Chris puts on a few, so his he kind of draws like a similar crowd to most of his stuff. It's Chris like, Marshall. Chris Marshall. Okay. Yeah. He puts on uh, one on Monday and Tuesday, and also Thursday. Where so at? Monday is at Barrel House. Okay. Um, or Gypsy Circus. It's yeah. One of those names. I'm not sure if it's both or what. Yeah. But. Downtown. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he also does. Um, let's see. Tuesdays at Union Place. Ah, which yeah. Is like right around the corner from yeah. U- UJ's, and then uh, Thursday is Open Chord. Yeah. Which everybody, most people know about that. You one. know Sammy McAteer? McAteer. I don't think so. He he runs around over at the Open Chord. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of the one of the guys in charge over there. He's a good dude. He's been on the podcast before. Have you? Uh, what about uh, uh, the? open mic at union place have you ever seen cornbread over there has uh, oh yeah i've seen cornbread a few times yeah open forum on thanksgiving and then again for christmas i'm we're gonna do that so you know that dude cornbread man he's wild he's wild he's awesome i love cornbread me too he's been over here twice for the podcast yeah yeah you can imagine how it went (laughs) awesome (laughs) it's hard to have a bad time with that guy it really is yeah so if you've only been here a year, where'd you start out? Where'd you Where'd you grow up? Well, I grew up around Dallas. Okay. And it was uh, until I was a late teenager. Moved then moved to Colorado with my parents. Okay. For and then I was there for about ten or eleven years before I wound up here. Okay. So how long were you in Dallas? Until I was about seventeen. So you were seventeen. So yeah. you went to high school there. I was homeschooled for high school. Okay. Yeah. Which explains a lot about me, most people say. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, homeschool kids are weird, but you're not. All right. <laughs> what was dad into? Is that why you guys moved? Was for job? Yeah, not well, I mean, looking for different opportunities. Okay. Um, I think they were just sick of Texas, too, you know, which is understandable. Texas is its own thing, man. Yeah, no, I, I love Texas, and I, yeah. I've lived back there again really? since for a brief amount of time, but... Yeah, I have no beef with it. I just, I could see why, if that's all you knew since you were young, you know. Yeah. Be eager to see something different. So, did you have brothers and sisters growing up? No, it was just me. Just you? Yeah. Okay. And what were your parents doing? What was dad doing for work? Working. Doing HVAC. So Heck yeah. When I used to do that, I was working for him. Okay. Yeah. And that was, I mean, that's mostly all he's done since I've been alive. You know. Blue collar dude huh <laughs> yeah made a lot of money hell yeah yeah that's uh that's uh uh an industry like construction people always always look at it like it's a hard scrabble deal but like you do commercial stuff or you do like focus on one thing and do it really well you can stay real busy and make a lot of money yeah for a long time definitely yeah yeah you always need your heater you know what i mean yeah <laughs> even no in texas uh, maybe not in Texas. <laughs> in Texas, they make all their money. Like if you run that kind of business, you make all your money in the summertime. Yeah, when people's stuff goes out. Yeah. yeah they're desperate. Yeah. We'll be over there in four days. A hot customer is way angrier than a cold customer. Uh, are they? It's, yeah. Yeah, there's like some, uh, there's like this um, – there's like this uh, – these two uh, lines of – like crime versus ice cream sales or something like that <laughs> in New York City. And it's like they don't have anything honest. to do with each other, yeah. right? Except hot days. Except hot days yeah. are when both of them happen. Yeah. It's people are pissed off. It's like being hungry, you know. You don't even realize what's what's wrong with you. Yeah. You yeah. Just, I don't know what happened. I lost my mind. I was hot, man. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start working for your dad? When you were in high school, did he take you, take you with him? I did a little bit of that, like helping him install stuff and all that kind of stuff when I was younger and then tried not to do it for a little while, but then the money kind of sucked me in, so. Yeah. Texas isn't like a union state, is it? Like where there's a bunch of unions you got to mess around with and all that? I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just know some guys, I remember meeting them and they worked in HVAC and they worked in like, I think St. Louis or something like that. And they were really young. 
They're like, I make $35 an hour doing HVAC. And I'm like, you're 17 years old. <laughs> like, that's good money, dude. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. It's great money. Uh, so Colorado, how'd you like that? I loved Colorado. You moved there when you were a teenager? Yeah. And kind of discovered nature. I was like, oh, shit, you can go hiking and, like, stuff people don't really do in Texas too often. Where'd y'all live? Um, In Denver, around Denver. Okay. Yeah. The front range. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Did you get pick up skiing? I did skiing a little while, but it was too hard on my knees, so I had to switch mm. to snowboarding. And Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of it to go around out there. It's amazing. It really is. Yeah. Did you pick up the fly fishing thing around then, or did you do that? That was afterwards. Uh, that's more recent, like okay. the last few years. But I did a little bit of that in Colorado and really enjoyed it. And then have had no, I haven't caught a single fish here yet. So that's oh, man. disappointing. You got to go with me tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. We're 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 going we're going out. I I would, but I have a, th- a thing tomorrow <laughs> at noon. <laughs> you do. But otherwise, I definitely would. <laughs> I'll take you sometime. Yeah. We'll catch fish. That'd be great. Yeah. I'm sure you know the spots. Yeah, there's some around. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not like it's not like Colorado or Montana or anything like that, but there's places Yeah. There's places to go. I've been going to the national park, um the Smokies? Yeah. I yes. it's close to where I live. Okay, where you where do you live? Um closer to Sevierville. Okay. It's like it's 20 minutes for me to the national park. That's great, dude. Yeah. Smokies are really amazing. There's some good brook trout streams in there and some good just the Everything about it's beautiful. Yeah. Except the Ohioans. <laughs> What's wrong with Ohioans? Yeah, you know, just sit there in the park. <laughs> I don't have any beef with Ohioans, at yeah. least not to my knowledge. I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't either. I just, <laughs> their license plates get on my nerves. Yeah. <laughs> they, a, go, like, they go real slow, they're in, slow in the yeah. park. Like, I'm trying to get to. They don't see, like, curves very often. Yeah, or yeah. bears. Or bears. Yeah, so they, they slow down, get a little spectator traffic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to a park ranger up there. Like, I was on a motorcycle ride, and I was hiding from the rain. And it was mm-hmm. just me and these couple of park rangers that were, like, also hiding from the rain under this little awning. So I figured I might as well start a conversation. And uh, they were telling me about bear jams. Oh, I don't know about bear jams. Oh, when, when bears are on the side of the road yeah, and they everybody like a, stops? They have, like, a turn for it. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was like six hours of bear jams that day or something. Yeah, and they just say it like it's a thing. Mm-hmm. Everybody should know. Yeah. What kind That's of motorcycle do you ride? It's a little Harley. Okay. Yeah. I've had so I've had a ton. You but, have? Yeah. But that's what I settled on. It's like small and reasonably slow but still fun. It's so not the 500, is it? No. It's not that small. Yeah. It's I mean, it's a 1200. But oh, well, yeah. Comparatively to like sport bikes and stuff that i used to ride it feels manageable and really slow. it keeps me like from doing anything stupid alive yeah it's beautiful riding through the park man yeah it is yeah before the fucking ohioans get there Be- <laughs> 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 they're fine as a people yeah they're no, fine you're fine yeah. just you know drive a curvy road every now and then yeah yeah are you uh in any uh any like serious groups right now any serious bands that are doing anything any recording or is it all kind of solo stuff i there's a band that i'm working with called the medicine Mm. and it's a lot of the stuff that i have been doing solo that is going to be like just infinitely better with a full band of like really good musicians Mm. to make the tunes better and to make them like come to life you know gotcha yeah are you playing keys in that outfit are you doing the doing it all keys and guitar a little bit and then i've got a a drummer johnny thompson okay and him and i sort of met first and hit it off it was actually at one of those open jams he was hired to be the drummer that night and i think i was hired to play lead or either that or i just wound up coming by because my other gig ended early or whatever but uh yeah, he was like, oh, man, I really like your songs. I think that I would, you know, it, I'd be down to, like, play and help you record it a little bit and all that nice. kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, sweet. Like, this guy seems cool. So we played with some ideas and started recording a little bit and then decided we needed a bass player. So we looked around a little bit and found this guy, Mike Jones, who's, like, killer. He's this singer-songwriter guy. That's how most people know him. But he's more recently at least started 
taking bass gigs. I think I would assume he played bass for a while because he's pretty really? good. But he just recently started trying to be a bassist. So, you know, I feel like I snagged him before anyone else got him. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, then we've got Michael Bates on guitar, who's like my favorite guitar player in Knoxville. Played with him on several jams. And he's like the kind of guy, like you were saying with Cornbread, like not that they're similar, but in the sense that an unforgettable type of person yeah yeah and michael bates is like that like he's just nothing but good vibes and it's hard to have a bad time playing music with that guy and he's an amazing guitar player so all of us together kind of like focused on the same things like the same genre type of music that we like we all like that really like juicy kind of how do you describe it romantic like sexy stuff so all that stuff um coming to life as a band is pretty exciting how did you track all these people down after only being here for a year how'd you plug yourself <laughs> into the scene well open jams and being the house drummer at something like that but like i mean you, you don't just show up and you're the house drummer somewhere like you gotta you gotta poke around in some circles and some people yeah. recognize that you know what you're doing before you know people yeah. people bring you along with them so that seems to have happened pretty quickly for you yeah I kind of knew what to do because in Denver, I had played bass in a band. It was like a funk band, um, and they had hosted an open jam, and so I had gotten used to that template of showing up and kind of showcasing your skills and meeting all kinds of musicians that come out to that kind of stuff. It just kind of, I mean, 99% of the gigs that you get as a musician are just because somebody, it's who you know. I mean, it obviously matters whether you can play the gig well or not, too, but people call their friends when they need somebody for a gig. So, and is it like anything else where people like working with people who are decent humans? <laughs> yeah, people always say you got to be a good hang. Yeah. That's like a primary factor. I mean, that's mostly what I had to say about all the guys in the medicine, for example. Yeah. It's kind of assumed that you're a good player if you're joining a certain level of band, but if mm. you you know, it's like earlier you were joking about like musicians just showing up you can get a gig that way. Yeah. Like being a good human is also a ridiculously low standard, but that is kind of what it is. It's really? like, you know, if you're not fun to hang out with and cool to be around, then it's hard to work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you always hear about those, you know, the, those guys who are just notorious assholes. I think of like, uh, like Tom Petty or something yeah. like that. Just everybody knows them as an asshole. Yeah. It's like, but that's Tom Petty. Like he, he probably had to be decent to work with until everybody realized how awesome he was, <laughs> you know, decent yeah. to be around. Right. Right. You can't start out as an asshole. <laughs> yeah. You got to have some kind of weight to your name. You know, <laughs> people won't put up with your shit. Yeah. Yeah. Why'd you move here? Uh, just wanted to, live somewhere that was kind of in the mountains and i mean denver had gotten denver's changed a lot since i moved there it's gotten yeah. significantly more expensive and way busier yeah and uh, did they we, legalize weed what when you were when mm -hmm. you were there 2014 yeah yeah did you recognize a lot of extra tourism and extra people moving there <laughs> and a lot of traffic yeah oh absolutely it's yeah. pretty overwhelming yeah, you know the and weed tourism, and then also people just moving there because they don't want to go to jail for having some weed in their car. <laughs> yeah, totally, both of those things, and then it just drives the price up so much. Yeah, it's yeah. also a badass place to live. Oh yeah, I mean it's the secret is out now with Denver for sure, but the music scene had also kind of shut down there with COVID and everything. Mm. It shut down more than it did in Tennessee, most yeah. definitely. So well, why'd you pick Knoxville though? Is there a good well, reason for it? I had thought about going to Nashville mm -hmm. um, with some of those guys that I was in the band with in Denver. Ah, uh, the the jazz band? The, yeah, I like jazz. Or funk. funk band, yeah. Both, but yeah. yeah um, and just went to check out Nashville and was not really digging it. I don't really? Know. I stayed there for a few days, and I was like, I went down the main street. I don't know if it's Broadway. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, I didn't hate it, but it definitely seemed like a gig circuit that doesn't really fit what I want to do. Yeah. And I'm sure it does exist there, like a good gig circuit. Yeah. That's what you call oh, it. And I've heard that it definitely does. Yeah. It's probably harder to break into because right. I bet everybody wants to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I also, I, I mean, I really love the mountains in Denver and stuff and with it getting so crowded, it was hard to go hike or anything and mm. enjoy yourself when it's just overrun, you know? Yeah. 
So I was like, man, I can get closer to the mountains. I can still be close to Nashville if I want to gig there and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, if it's a worthwhile excursion. Yeah. Yeah. And I keep saying Knoxville. You don't you, know, you don't necessarily live in Knoxville, but I guess you're here enough to where you play yeah. out. I basically work here. You work here. Yeah. And live near the mountains. Yeah. That's a, that's uh something that uh, a lot of people don't – it's one of those unsung things about Knoxville is that if you're willing to drive a little bit every day, you can live right at the foot of the Great Smoky Mountains National yeah. Park. Well, you could just edit that part out because we don't need anybody else moving here. <laughs> we're it, As long as we don't legalize weed, we're going to be all right. <laughs> I don't think there's any danger in that happening yeah. anytime soon. Yeah. But I love it. Well, good, man. I mean, it seems like just – you know, keep seeing you around and hearing your name around. So it seems like you're making a, a bit of a splash, which is which is nice. And I hope we get to hear some of your music later. We got your stuff set up back there. So are you uh are you are you writing stuff for you or are you writing stuff for the band right now? Or does it kind of work through you and then it and um, then now now that you have a band at your disposal you can kind of workshop it that way. Yeah. I think that we will Right now, that's basically what it is. It's like I had written a lot of tunes already, probably 10 or 11 songs that needed to be like hashed out in the sense of how does this work with a band and all that kind of stuff. Because I'd played them at various jams with people, um, but actually sort of orchestrating, producing the song a little bit more, like finding things that only musicians who play together a lot can be in on adds Mm -hmm. a whole other element to the music than just just jamming. Nuance? Yeah, a lot of nuance and like stops and just more interesting things that you have to see coming that wouldn't work in a jamming context, you know. Yeah, surprising the listener. Yeah. And if and, and he'll also surprise your bass player if he doesn't know <laughs> what's coming. <laughs> totally. So, yeah. Yeah, so we've got that going on, um but I'm sure some of the like I mentioned, like a couple of the band members are very good songwriters and singers and stuff like that as well. So, as we we're just in our beginning stages right now, kind of mm. in the sense of, I mean, we've, we've got gigs and stuff like we can play great, but in the sense of really dying, dialing in the details of our tunes that we've written, like we're in the early stages of that right now. Gotcha. Yeah. Have you been in a bunch of bands or yeah, yeah. yeah I've been, I've been in a ton of bands. Are, are you, <laughs> are, where do you like fall in? I, I, I assume that if you're a player of a certain ilk that, um, at some point you have to decide like, am I, do I want to be like the, do I want to be in the background? Do I just want to be support staff? Do I want to be laying it down for everybody else? Or do I want to be one of the ones who's pushing the art and the voice of this thing and moving it forward with mm. my stamp on it a little more? Yeah. Um, did you have to decide uh, what, if you kind of where you kind of fit in at some point or did you do both? Yeah. Did you start off just being, uh, you know, the, the last guy in the band and then now you're actually getting to, you know, put your own music out there. That's a really interesting question. I think that, uh, you're definitely right. Like when you can put your stamp on something, it's hard not to, and mm-hmm. you gotta be careful about that in certain projects. Like right. there's some stuff that that's not what's being said with the music. So you have to keep your stamp off of it and play mm. something else. You know what I mean? But I like the production side and stuff for that reason because it's, it's fun to listen to the song and tell, have it tell you, you know, what it needs as opposed to always putting your stamp on something. Um, but when it comes to what you do, it's a very different approach. Then it's – that's what the medicine is all about is sort of all of us collaborating to make sure that it, we're playing something that we really like. Um but that we also think will translate to like a wider audience outside of just musicians. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes, that makes good sense. I, I just always, you see kind of these different kinds of bands and I, I, I like, I like jam bands. I listen to, you know, guys that are out there that are maybe influenced by jazz um, or bluegrass, but it's all seems like everybody gets to pass it around. And at some point, you know, have it be about them for a second but then i also see bands with these really intriguing front men and just kind of it all seems like it's about one person yeah and do you do do you feel like your music falls in into that uh when you bring your solo stuff into a group of people that maybe haven't heard or maybe had no part in writing the music 
like, do you have to kind of be careful too about not making it all about this ego trip? Yeah, no, you do for sure. And that's something that I, I mean, I'm not, I would, my worst nightmare is being the center of attention, especially on stage. Like, really? that's why I love working with these guys is that they can take up that space too. Mm. And, you know, we just have a good chemistry together, but it's, yeah, there's certainly an element of, um, that's what I was saying earlier is like, I really would like those guys to start to incorporate their writing and stuff too. I just think that it's been a little overwhelming learning all these tunes that I've sort of like, that we've started out with, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're great writers too. And I'm sure that'll wind up being part of it. Good. Yeah. Have you, uh, recorded anything with the medicine yet? Uh, yeah, we've, so we're working on our first couple singles right now. Okay. Um, and it's a little bit of a slow process cause we're doing it from home. And so there's a lot of like certain people coming over certain days to track mm. stuff kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, but we've also done a few sessions at home and, uh, tomorrow we're filming another one too. Cool. So that should be pretty exciting. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys have a place people can find that stuff? Yes. So there's going to be, we're producing a, a video series from the house. Um, it's going to be called the plant sessions. You've got a bunch of plants in your uh, yeah. space there. We do have a, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So figured why not keep it simple. Bunch of, li- bunch of live, uh, vegetation in there. I was surprised when I saw that. I was like, my man over here, you know, not married, <laughs> living I in a house. plants, man. I used to have a plant problem. <laughs> really? Like, I used to have probably 75 plants. It looks like you kind of still do. 75 is a lot. Though. We have a lot because my girlfriend's mom works at a plant store. Okay. And has encouraged my plant habit again. So we do have a lot of plants. <laughs> and there were some plants that were no longer needed at her mom's house that have been incorporated into the house you've adopted some plants i've adopted some plants why did you start this plant uh fetish (laughs) i you know i really like having plants inside i don't know (laughs) it's as simple as that they make you feel good yeah i what i hate is fake plants yeah like it makes me angry how do you feel about fake christmas trees same different about that i'm i could see why you don't want something like a dead tree in your house dropping all the needles but a live plant is definitely better than a fake plastic plant. I agree. Yeah, man. The uh, the people we bought this this house from they uh, they had an an orchid that they left behind and left it in the corner of the kitchen and it was beautiful. And I mean, we were here for a month before I realized it was fake. When I went to water it for the first time, so they they're doing really well in the <laughs> fake plant game, <laughs> tricking people. That's great. I know. What what's your uh what what's your go to with uh with the plants? What's your favorite one? I mean, you got to start with something. We started with like ZZs mm. and um, let's see, what else? Snake plant was was one of our first yeah. go tos. I think my pl- my first plant was probably some kind of an aloe or something like that. Yeah, but I mean, I've I think I have a bit of a green thumb or something. I've never really worried about killing plants. That's good. Yeah, just go around feel the soil. Every now and then. Yeah. Check them out. Just fine. You know, the internet will tell you what your plant needs. Yeah. It looked like, uh, I mean, it was like between two ferns on steroids at your at your house <laughs> over there, man, with your videos you yeah. were recording. For sure. It feels yeah. fun when you're playing the drums. It's like you're in the jungle, you know? Are they shaking around with all the air moving? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Probably for sure. dancing a little. Yeah. You guys have any gigs coming up as the medicine? We we're not we haven't nailed down any dates yet, but we do have like a few gigs over the next few months already sort of like coming into the good. works. So that's yeah. good. What are some rooms around here that you're wanting to play? Um, well, Alley Rays is one that's asked us to play. Um, that seems like a cool spot. It's like brand new. I don't know about that place. I've played there as a bass player in another band, Al- Alex and the Animals, mm. with Alex Forrester. Um, that's who's opening for Cornbread on Christmas. Okay. Yeah. We got to talk about Alex and the animals at yeah. some point too. Yeah, they're fun. Um, but yeah, Alley Rays is cool. I want to play. I still haven't played Press Pub, even though I've been here a while, which is kind of, I mean, other than being an opener. Yeah. You know, so but I've you have played, played on that stage? Yeah. Okay. I haven't played Scruffy yet, though. It's a good room, too. Yeah. Yeah. What about Barley's? What, how's that? Have you been to a show I like, there? I like Barley's. I've played there a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Medicine will definitely be playing there, too. Awesome. Yeah. Trying to think of some other ones. I think the uh, from what I hear, the square room may be getting uh, 
turned over hands, maybe changing hands soon. Do you know about that place? Mm -mm. Do you know where Cafe Four is on Market Square? I'm not well, like I'm not well acquainted with Knoxville yet. Well, there's there's this there's this stage behind Cafe Four uh, that they that they built to be kind of like an event space, but also they did church in there. They may still, um, but also like a decent size, maybe a 200 person venue, something like that. Um, nice. So not terribly small. There's actually glass in between, or used to be, I don't know if it's still there or not, but uh, in between Cafe Four, the restaurant just has curtains in front of it, but you can open the curtains and see the entire venue, like the entire back wall of the venue is glass. So you can see in there from the restaurant. And uh, it's, I hear that it just changed hands and it might be getting a little life breathed into it because it's been an underutilized room for live music. They've used it for events. I've been to a few different events there, some other things, art shows and stuff like that. But there's a stage that uh, you could do music on. If you can do music in the corner at Union Jacks, you can do music in, on, on this <laughs> on this stage because it's, uh, it's, it's uh, decently sized and really good vibe in there. So I, I hope that happens. I hope that room comes around. I'm trying to think of some other ones around that I that are um, kind of unsung little places that you don't really focus on. I guess Prez Pub and Barley's are the big ones downtown. Um, but I've had a hell of a great time at those uh, at Union Place when they do open mics there. There's been some great stuff coming through there, and that's almost feeling better to me than you know going to. Uh, some of these more well-known places and, and seeing the same band for the 15th time. Yeah. You know, going to these. You're more likely to see something new. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, we were talking about it before the podcast. Like, I'm I'm so happy to, like, see this world that I don't know anything about yet of these. I mean, I assume you're 10 years younger than me about somewhere in there. And, like, this new guard coming in and playing their asses off and playing really good stuff and getting recognized it, it it feels really nice to to see great stuff coming down the pike and it's you know uh, uh, I, I think it as a as a generational thing you're worried like is is this just gonna is this just gonna burn out and we're not and and we don't have any you know what's our sound gonna be as a town as a culture as mm -hmm. a people over the next little bit and I think we're starting to like I'm starting to notice a little bit of a style coming out up here, and it's kind of cool. What's that style? What do you think? Well, I, I, I think that there's some like synth, key, heavy music that still feels like Appalachia. Hmm. There's some stuff like that that is just I still feel the South in in some of this stuff, even though it may be a little more electronic or a little more thrusty and uh, tight jeaned than, than stuff we've heard before. Yeah. Like we've been great at making Americana music and, and like some, you know, proggy stuff, bar rock, but I don't know. I, th I think there's this, I think there's this sound that's influenced by where we are, but it's also influenced by, by, you know, the the internet and kids that grew, have grown up playing electronic instruments listening to MGMT or whatever it is you know indie stuff yeah and and it just it seems like it melds well melds well together but it doesn't feel alien to me for some reason cuz it seems like it always comes back to a little rooty rooted around here a little bit i got I you know. i'm not sure i've heard that that sounds cool though you haven't mm -hmm. maybe it's my perspective <laughs> Maybe maybe it's just seeing a little. Uh, maybe it's just seeing somebody I'm familiar with up there and 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 hearing that uh, hearing that stuff come out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of some other. I'm trying to think of some other rooms that are. I mean, we went. Me and Sam took the SOS Christmas party to the Bijou the other night and saw the Mike McGill Christmas Spectacular. And Mike's been around forever. But what was really cool about that is that he brought out. I don't know. Probably over the course of the night. 10, 15, 20 artists maybe um, that had never played the Bijou before. And it was an opportunity for them to play on like one of the, you know, historic hundred year old stages. That's cool. In town. So, yeah. I mean, it, it was kind of a moment for, for people who hadn't, who hadn't ever thought they were going to play that big stage and, yeah. and got to do it. For sure. Yeah. 
But you got to go play Thompson Bowling. That's where you're. That's, <laughs> that's where you're headed. I definitely would like to do an opening gig at the Bijou or the Tennessee Theater or something. You know, start out like. I mean, this band is hopefully good enough, good enough in my eyes that we could do better than that in the long run. But. How do you do that? I mean, how do you? I mean, I know that you know bands will tour around and they'll pick up a regional act to open for them because it's cheaper than traveling their, you know, their own opener with them. Yeah. So how do you get plugged into to that world to where somebody in your genre is coming by and finds you? I mean, I've gotten I've gotten gigs like that in the past for other bands that I was in just by messaging um the band on social media yeah getting (laughs) out there and just letting them know that i wanted to open for them you know if you're usually your music when you're dealing with musicians your music sort of speaks for itself so if it's something that they would like they'll they'll let you open if they know you can hang yeah everybody needs the room a little bit warm when they get out there right yeah it's nice they need something to happen other than silence while they're backstage yeah (laughs) being 30 minutes late to play for sure yeah opener you know it can't make or break your set but it makes a big difference for sure yeah yeah and as an opener like eric baker is a guy that um i feel like i've had in the shop to talk to who has um who really took a good opportunity opening i think he was open for john legend at the tennessee theater Mm. and it was huge for his career like so many people found him and then you know the ripple from from the 2000 people that saw him before John Legend at the Tennessee Theater were like this guy is emerging yeah like let me let me grab on and then he like blew up into this having this you know national following after just a couple of shows and he'd been a journeyman he'd been working at it singer songwriter he already had everything in the yeah. you know in his quiver but it just took getting noticed you know and opening for somebody Sometimes you just need to get that momentum started, you know? Yeah. And Eric Baker, if you're watching, I know you're playing the Tennessee Theater on the 12th, and we would love to open for you. So (laughs) Ah, hit us up. Listen to you go. (laughs) I love it. Have you been to Bonnaroo? I have not because it was canceled this year. Yeah. Yeah. And last year. Oh, yeah? (laughs) Yeah. It got canceled this year because of flooding and last year because of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. You should should set your sights on that, too. That's a, a real way to get in front of 20,000 people for no good reason because totally. <laughs> they w- don't have anywhere else to go on a Thursday night or whatever. Yeah, any major festival gig is a super fun one for yeah. sure. You know? Well, talking about Moon Taxi, uh, I feel like that's uh, a way that, that they kind of started off and got a really good following really quickly. Obviously, they're good, but they also were put in front of these festival crowds and, you know, rocked these people's asses off who didn't know what was coming and kind of grassroots up a following in a, you know, fairly short order. Yeah. And have hung on to it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of talk around amongst musicians, like negative talk about playing for exposure. Yeah. Because you hear that in all kinds of contexts. Like sometimes it's at a place where you're not actually going to get a lot of exposure. Or instead of getting paid. Right. You're going to get all kinds of exposure. Yeah. I'm still looking for a place to cash in exposure bucks. (laughs) Have you found a place? Yeah, exactly. To... That uh, takes them? Well, you know, if you play at Bonnaroo, that might be worth something. That's what I mean. Like, <laughs> yeah. those exposure bucks are worth something. Yeah, I talked to this guy. Um, his name's J.D. Wilkes, and he is the front man for a band called the Legendary Shack Shakers. And I saw them at Bonnaroo in, like, 2005 or something like that. And it was. It was on a Thursday night. Everybody was so excited to be at the festival. There wasn't much music going on. And these guys were playing – one of the biggest tents at Bonnaroo uh, and you know they were a small band that played in little little bars in Nashville and Kentucky but they just rocked people's socks off man yeah and I saw this guy about two years later in LA at the knitting factory I saw him and went to their show and there were like you know 50 people there and I asked him I was like I found out about you guys at Bonnaroo. He's like you have no idea how many people tell me that at, mm. at shows. Yeah. And he's like that was the hardest show we've ever played in our entire life. I was like why? He's like you know, we couldn't get our van close to the stage. We had to carry all our shit over there just because they were the yeah. you know, an afterthought band that was added at the last minute right. and they just weren't, you know, they weren't the big guys that got to fly in on helicopters and you right. know, get their stuff loaded on stage for them. Yeah. But he was like, it was totally worth it. And we got paid and, and it was and it was uh a huge crowd, the biggest crowd we've probably ever paid played for. And it's you know, one of the one of the most important shows of our career, even though 
you know, it was hard and not necessarily uh, something that we even knew we were doing three days before. It. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to answer the bell. Yeah. Opportunity, you know. Yeah, you should definitely uh, check out Bonnaroo if you get if you get a chance to as a as a, a patron, but hopefully as a as one of the entertainers. Yeah, both. I would love to. I would love to check it out. Have you played festivals before? Um, smaller festivals than that, but yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's a fun gig. The vibe is fun at festivals. Like people are ready to hear some fun music. Yeah. So party it up. Yeah. You always want to play like Friday. You know, one of the first days of the festival. Yeah. Sunday's a little harder. Mm. You know, everybody's kind of worn People out. People are a little burnt out, yeah. They hadn't slept much at that point. Yeah, yeah they've been awake for three days. No more serotonin. Yeah, it's yeah. completely depleted. <laughs> Pineal gland, done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how long did it take you once you moved here to, to get your like to get your first gig? Or when did you start looking? Was it like still boxes at the house? And then you... There might have been. I wasn't yeah. super fast to unpack. <laughs> but uh, my first gig was actually that guy, Chris Marshall, I was telling you about. That same gig that Did I do. Did you run into him sometimes? <laughs> well, I was at his open jams. Nice. And, uh, you know, must have jumped on the drum kit or something at some point. And he just offered for me to be the drummer for that when I can do it. So so you were just showing up as like a patron slash I might be able to slide in here if... Uh... Somebody needs to <laughs> yeah, take I a mean, break. That's, you know, that's usually how it works is your first gig is that somebody knows you can, like I said earlier, like if they know what you can do, they'll call you. So you just got to get in front of people and let them know that you can play. And then show up. Yep. And then actually show up, be on time, be early if possible, but just at least be on time. Yeah. See, you're going to do... You're you're gonna you're you're gonna have a <laughs> long career in music. I mean, taking it seriously isn't that the problem with so many, yeah, so, so many musicians. Well, I've been in bands before where it was normal for people to show up late, like after showtime, um, and they were good enough bands that they, they got rebooked, I guess. But it's also, unprofessional, right? Yeah, it's super unprofessional, and I'm sure it'd it'd be a lot harder to like ask for more money or something for the gig if that's your attitude, you know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta treat it like a job, man. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, I'm super pumped that uh, that you're playing out and playing around, and that you're just really obviously talented. But your music is very easy and fun to listen to, to, and it. has a good has a good vibe and a good a, a good a good thump back there. You can. You can Get a little, get a little hip action going yeah. to most of it. Too. Man, wait till you hear it with a live band. That's really, it's astronomically more groovy. Really, know? yeah. It's like the same level of feeling, but there's more people involved in making that happen. So you so. feel like it pluses the texture of the of the music. Yeah, in a big way, it makes it more danceable. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Just easier to. You don't have to listen to it as much. You can feel it more. Are you finding a following? Are you finding people who are seeking you out and trying to just kind of come wherever you are and listen? Considering the stage that we're at, Was the amount of people who are interested in the medicine and asking about it all the time that I've told about it and stuff are, is pretty high. Like Good. Compared to any other band I've been in, I don't know. I feel like there's a fair level of people being excited about it considering they haven't heard it yet because people know those players and – the idea of us coming together in their minds is pretty exciting, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So I like it. Was it you that put it together? Did were you the catalyst that kind of got everybody in? Yeah, I was kind of like looking to start a band. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, because everyone was all. I mean, it, that's how it really started. Was people were asking me at jams and places like that, or if I had a gig. Like a lot of times, people would know that I sing and write. And you know, if you're playing a three, four hour gig, like sometimes it's helpful if the guy you hired for drums can jump up and sing a few tunes. Sure. So I was exposing that music around town and people would always ask me like, Oh, what's like, do you have a, your band? You know? And I was always like, no, like, so it eventually just kind of had to happen, which I like. It doesn't feel forced, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, yeah. And then, so I met up with Johnny, like I had mentioned to you earlier. And then from there it just kind of stemmed meeting the other guys. Johnny had worked with Mike Jones on some other gigs and recommended him as a bass player. And then we all knew Michael Bates independently. I think everyone's played with him. So 
Do you remember when you first got to town, um, like one of the first musicians you had heard of that you felt like was a local talent? Um, Everybody talks about Red. Everybody loves you, Red. I don't know Red. Red? You don't know Red? I mean... With two Ds? The Is it the... Uh, the lady that sang Brand New Key at Union Jacks the other night? Yeah. 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 She's great. Yeah. She's great. She is great. Beautiful voice. Great stage presence. Yeah. Yeah. I was captivated. Totally. She does that to every, every room she plays. Everybody's really? Everybody's like, oh, shit, who's this, you know? Is that her name, Red? Red. I obviously, yeah. I mean, I knew exactly who you were talking about. Yeah. But so, so she must be doing something right. Yeah. No, she's great. So I heard a lot about Red before I met Red. Really? Everybody likes, I mean, how do you not love it, you know? What does she do? Uh, does she play guitar or anything? Sings and plays guitar, and she's a writer as well. Okay. Yeah. I think she was just singing when I saw her, maybe. Maybe she was. People, she's the kind of person she gets asked to sing, like, everywhere she goes. Yeah. So, you know, she'll jump up there even if she doesn't have her guitar sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So your uh, your last name is Van Way, is that how you say it? Yeah. Are you Dutch? I believe so, yeah. I don't know a lot about my, you know, lineage or whatever. Everybody's a van in in Holland. I've been there a bunch of times. Yeah. Everybody's a van or something. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we don't go digging too far back (laughs) to see what... I'm like, ah, probably English, Scottish. It's probably somewhere in there. (laughs) That sounds good. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to find any cousins back there. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know why I've just never been very interested in... I mean, it probably would be interesting information to know, but... I'm ne- I've never been compelled to look into it. Uh, yeah, I'd say Dutch if I was going to look at you. you yeah. Know? <laughs> Tall, van last name. Yeah. <laughs> that all makes sense to me. You want to play some music? Yeah, I would love to. You want to? Yeah. Is there anything else we need to talk about before we do that? Anything else we need to talk about? Well, I wanted to let you know where to find the plant sessions because that's where some of our first videos are going to be posted and okay. also – um, any musicians listening, if you want your group to come on, you'll have to hit us up because we're going to have different groups on nice. all the time. It's going to be like a YouTube video series. Super fun, man. Yeah. So, Because my girlfriend, Jess, is a like professional video yeah. and photographer. Jess and has been thing. on the show before. Yeah. Jess exactly. Maples. Yeah. Yeah. So, she is great. And so her and I meeting up because I have recording experience and know a lot of musicians. Um, that's why we wanted to produce a video series. That's Plus, awesome plants are groovy and they need to they need to be seen yeah you're, yeah you're and they need some they need some music in the house yeah. some more music in the, some different music in the house plants like music they say um so where do you find it so on instagram it's going to be at the plant sessions at the plant sections yep the plant sessions, sessions. yep and then it will be the plant sessions.com and then instagram for the medicine is at take your rx Ooh. Like take your prescription. Yeah. yeah. So that's everything will be posted there too. And I'm sure we'll have a Facebook. Yeah. So it's Dude. all just getting, getting just going. In the, just in the making. Well, this is our last podcast of the year. So, that's great. Yeah. So cheers, Sam. Cheers, Sam. For a go- another good year in the shop. <laughs> ah, you did it. A round of applause for himself. Yeah. <laughs> he deserves it, man. He's the hardest working dude in show business. Well, I appreciate you being here and I'm excited to uh I'm excited to see what you're gonna play for us. Thank you, man. We're gonna get set up and uh and do it. Let's do it. Sweet. Cool. Hell yeah. All right. Man, if only all, all conversations could have mics and headphones.